So you're here because your teacher made you read Flannery O'Connor's A Good Man is Hard to Find. That's okay. I'll help you out as much as I can. Here on this series, we call Simply Lit. If you enjoy this video, please like and subscribe, and if you'd like to donate to my audio career, please do so at my PayPal link in the video description. Also, after listening to the video, feel free to ask me any questions related to your homework that you think I can help with, or any questions that will help you understand the story better. And please feel free to make requests for videos on other literature in the comments. Now please enjoy this brief summary and brief analysis of Flannery O'Connor's A Good Man is Hard to Find, and sit tight from another entry from Simply Lit. A man named Bailey wants to take his family from Georgia to Florida for a summer vacation. That's all he wants, and old Bailey seems to be the type who never gets what he wants. But his mother, referred to as the grandmother in the story, wants him to drive to East Tennessee where the grandmother has friends, connections. What kind of connections can grandma have anyway? I don't see her palling around with Tennessee natives Justin Timberlake and Randy Orton. She argues that Bailey's children, John Wesley and June Starr, and the little baby have never been to East Tennessee. And to help her case, she shows him a news article about a crazy escaped murderer who calls himself the misfit who was last seen in Florida. No one seems to take her especially seriously, because as you'll see, this grandma kind of sucks. The next morning, it's off to Florida, because God damn it, Bailey needs a win. Everyone piles in the car, including the grandmother, who seems fine with Florida now, mostly because she has secretly stowed away her cat, Pity Singh, who she thought would die without her. Grandma's vanity knows no ends. Bailey finds Grandmother sitting in the car dressed in her best clothes, which I imagine is like a thrift store sequined black dress and an ostentatious hat, most likely with feathers and fruits and birds. If she should die in an accident along the road, she wants people to see her sexy corpse and know she was refined and a lady. Oh, Grandmother, for real, check your vanity, or your open loud mouth will give you cavities. As they say, they hit the road and begin the trip from Georgia to Florida. The grandmother won't shut the hell up during the trip, trying to get her two grandchildren to like her by playing games they think are dumb and telling them lame-ass jokes and a story that no one gives a shit about. Even annoying and bratty June Star comments on how dumb all of grandma's geriatric and racist BS is. I'm even getting tired talking about this old bee. The grandmother recalls her youth in the Old South, reminiscing about her youthful courtships and how she'd hide other cats in her basket, if you know what I mean. <coughs> or is it hide a basket in her pu- uh, never mind. She argues everything was better in her time, when children were respectful because they were constantly beaten by their parents and forced to work from the age of 10, and people did right then by being even more selfish a-holes than we are today. When the family stops at a sexy diner outside of Timothy for lunch, she talks to the owner, Red Sammy, about the misfit. He and the grandmother agree that things were much better in their really shitty past where the life expectancy was 50, and that the world at present is a degenerate one with its modern-day caring and sensitivity, those pesky contemporary folk and their concern for human rights. She agrees with Sammy's comment that a good man is hard to find, or as they say, a hard man is good to find. After the family returns to the road, the grandmother tells the children a story about a mysterious house from her childhood that should be on their way. She says the house has a secret panel with, like, gangsta treasure, like iPhone 6, bro. She finally has the children's attention. She riles up these already very annoying children, and so they harass their father until he reluctantly agrees to allow them just one side trip. Oh, Daddy, please let us go. We might shut up for just one minute. Oh, please, Dad, don't be the sorry SOB you always are. Oh, please, Dad, I thought you finally were going to prove us wrong by not being a piece of trash. Jeez, just leave Bailey alone. 
As Bailey drives them down a remote, super creepy dirt road, no signs of a house, the grandmother suddenly realizes that the house she was thinking of was actually in Tennessee, not in Georgia. And she doesn't think to tell anyone. Jesus, grandmother, I could not make a list of all the ways you suck. It would be infinite. She is so startled by this realization that she involuntarily kicks and kicks the cat, which frightens the cat, causing it to jump from its hidden basket and spring claws first onto Bailey's head and shoulders conditioned head and shoulders. As the cat claws at poor Bailey's face, Bailey loses control of the car and the car veers off of the road and flips over. You just couldn't let the fellow have just one vacation without ruining his life. They end up in a ditch below the road near Tombsboro. Only the children's mostly quiet mother is hurt and everyone cares less about her than grandma. The children are just stoked. The only thing the daughter June Starr is even bummed is that no one died. Gosh, these kids are buttheads. And what kind of a name is June Star anyway? The grandmother is too busy worrying about herself and dealing with Bailey, who's one step closer to the edge and he's about to break. Shaking in the ditch like a bunch of crash test swamp rats, the family waits for help. The grandmother flags down a black hearse down the road until it stops. Three men with guns come out to talk with them. The grandmother recognizes the leader, the quiet man in glasses, as the misfit. And like the fool she is, she says out loud that she recognizes him. As kids eons ago may have said, smooth move, x -lax. The bespectacled man says he is indeed the misfit, and that it would have been better for them all if she hadn't said that she recognized him. Bailey then finally says to his mother, F you, mom. You are literally the worst. The grandmother tries to convince the misfit that he's a good dude who wouldn't want to hurt them. Then the misfit's men ask Bailey and John Wesley to take a stroll with him and just come look at the flowers in the woods. Two pistol shots ring out, and they dead. The misfit then puts on Bailey's shirt because he won't be needing it. The henchmen then return and take the children's mother, the baby, and June Star to put them out of their shite existence. Dizzy and in shock, the grandmother then pleads for her own life. She still tries to convince him that he's a good man and tells him he should pray to Jesus. The misfit instead tells a bit about himself, like his claims that he doesn't remember what crime he was accused of that got him in prison. And when doctors told the misfit that he had killed his own papa, he claimed that his father died in an influenza epidemic. When the misfit then talks to her about Jesus, on who he claims to have thought about a lot, he doubts his raising Lazarus from the dead. For it was not Lazarus he raised, but Ra's al Ghul from Batman. As the misfit speaks, he grows agitated and pissed off. He barks into the grandmother's lame face and claims that life has no pleasure but meanness. In her ever-confused state, the grandmother thinks she detects a moment of vulnerability in the misfit. She thinks that the misfit is going to cry. Of course he's not going to cry, grandmama. She suddenly is moved to call him her baby and reaches out to touch him. She touches his shoulder with affection and says, Why, you're one of my babies! You're one of my own children! Yeah, creepy, right? His reaction is to jump away as if he had a snake in his boot, and he kills her with three shots through the heart. Can't say I wouldn't do the same, told Jima. However, Grandma is different in this moment. Something has changed for her, and she's as mature as she ever was in these, her final moments. And she dies with a smile on her face, and a long iron gray hair on her body. God damn it, Emily from A Rose for Emily. Stop sleeping with all these corpses. When the family is all done being murdered, the misfit cleans his glasses and picks up the grandmother's cat, who's really the best and most innocent character in the story. Write your essay on that cat, and here's your title, Pity Sing, The Hidden Star of a Good Man is Hard to Find. The misfit states that the grandmother would have been a good woman if there had been somebody there to shoot her every minute of her life. Indeed, misfit, indeed. Analysis Let's talk about the ending. At the very end of the story, when the grandmother claims that the misfit is one of her children, she is having a revelation. 
She realizes that there are people outside herself who need love and that the misfit is suffering and needs love. In this moment, she's more mature than she's ever been. She's not being selfish. She's being human. And that's one reading. Or you could read it that she's just a crazy selfish bee that took this family on a wild ride while Yakety Sax played. Uh, that is... until she got them killed. Then, with no other course of action left, and in a last ditch attempt for survival, she played to the misfit's mommy issues. Oh, the misfit has a mommy, and mommy issues alright. And that mommy is crime. That's it for now, y'all. There's plenty more to analyze in this story than what I've just mentioned. I'm just gonna go on a road trip and not get murdered, hopefully. It seems increasingly hard to go out and not be murdered these days. Ah, c'est la vie in the US, eh? Maybe I'll see you next time, and maybe not. If you have any requests for short stories or poetry summaries and analysis, please let me know in the comments. Wishing you all a good day, and good luck with your homework. Feel free to ask me any questions related to your homework that you think I can help with. Please like and subscribe if you'd be so kind. Stay lit, and don't ever hide your poor cute cat in your purse. With Simply Lit.